You're listening to the Plane Talking UK podcast, the UK-based podcast written by a passenger for anyone. And here are your hosts, Carlos Stebbings, Matt Smith and Neville Bounds. Well, hello and welcome to episode number 178 of the Plane Talking UK podcast. I'm Carl Stebbings and, well, joining us here live at the seething charity air day are my co-hosts neville bounds matt smith and we've got guest uh, co-host as well uh, owen is here in the live studio and we've also got cameraman carl as well he's <laughs> just behind matt there so welcome everyone uh, to the show hello nev how's things with you yeah very good thanks carlos and um we're well, a great day today so far although the sun has just gone in yeah. just saying how nice the weather has been today but i think the rain might just hold off so i think we might be okay but have, uh, have, we, have we got rain in the forecast today no, no not no, really no, but okay. just looking at some of those clouds uh, right, but uh, okay. certainly the wind has got up a little bit uh, mm-hmm. since we're but uh, no, I think it's going to be a very nice day actually. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So, how are things for you, Matt? You've been uh, in full uh, tech overload this morning. I have been. I've, I've been having one or two little meltdowns. There's no two ways about that. But uh, yes, there we are. So th- this is my camera. I, I get to I get to show a camera of like everybody Ooh. out the front there. So it's uh, <laughs> yeah. I quite like this not having a camera on me, Lark. And this is this is, this is great. <laughs> this is like my favourite kind of show. Yes. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah. It's fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. I know. <laughs> Owen, you've joined us here live at Seething. You, you, yes. you've, you've left the uh, harp jet uh, uh, constrictions and joined us here. <laughs> just for a, a, a few days. Constrictions? <laughs> constrictions. <laughs> No, uh, guys, it's really not that bad working for a hub chair. I quite enjoy my job. Thank you very much, Carlos. Yeah. Pay no attention um, to the nasty man. It's fine. Just pretend it's not happening. <laughs> no, I do love being at, uh, uh, out at an air show, and uh, it's good, good. really, really good uh, fun getting together with all you guys, getting uh, to be here at Seething. Indeed. Excellent. So, Carl, you're going to say a quick hello then. Mr. Mr. Carl, you're going to say quick. Come on, he, <laughs> you, you know he's he's a bit camera shy, is Carl. Yes, yes, but uh, j- just say a quick hello, to Carl, to the listeners on the uh, around um, the globe. Good afternoon and welcome to Seething in Norfolk. Uh, hope <laughs> you have a great show. And, and Carl, Carl is our cameraman today. So Carl he's, go- is he's going to be because we've got a camera right up in the gods, basically, for want of a better word. Yeah. And, uh, and he's going to be up there, busy operating. Oh, hello, buggy. Sorry, <laughs> and uh, yes, he's going to be operating it when the air show starts around about two o'clock. So yeah. we're going to try and cram a show out very quickly. We are, and uh, and then the when the, get that all done before the show, the uh, flying starts. Which exactly, is going to be quite good. I'm sorry, I've lost the ability to talk today. Yes. Anyone would have thought I was stressed. <laughs> <laughs> so we've uh, we've got loads of great news stories to get through this week. Uh, we've also got uh, another fantastic segment. Uh, from Nev uh, with the uh, passenger experience segment now that's with uh, Jackie McHale Ooh. and uh, she's talking about her travels with Harpjet Ooh. and uh, Ooh, uh. we've also got we've also <laughs> also got a segment from Captain Nick we have uh, who sent in Very and uh, Captain Nick has sent us in a segment all about uh, safety videos. Yes, uh, um, a bit of a f- spur on from what we yes, were, what we were talking last about week. last week, wasn't it? Yeah. I think it was Singapore Airlines, wasn't it? We had uh, they'd released yeah. a new um, That's it. new video. So yes, and um, we've also got uh, a little bit of feedback as well from Glenn Taylor. Listener Glenn Taylor sent us yep. in some audio feedback, and uh, we have got the last of our interviews That's from right, yeah. uh, Riyadh that we yeah took, that was uh, uh, first officer Tiny, back. wasn't it? Yeah, Tiny. Yep. That was with the. Yep. Uh, the E3 Century, I think that was Indeed. the... Indeed. Uh, um, so, yeah, so, well, I suppose we, we better kick things off, really, do uh, as we uh, do, I think. Matt, are yeah, you ready? Okay. Everything yeah. good? Yeah. All greens? Yeah, yeah. all Excellent. greens, all greens, yeah. <laughs> so we are going to start the show, then, as we do each week with our rundown of the weekly news from around the world and the UK. So if you're ready, Matt... I am, yes. And if you're ready, Nev... Yes, I am. And if you're ready, Owen... I'm ready. Let's go. So, kicking off this week's first news story, this one is on the Sun. Uh, .co.uk website. Oh, good, a quality publication. A quality <laughs> publication here in the UK. And uh, the headline, Jet 2's company uh, shock for Brit tourists returning from Spain as they realise their flight is being escorted by a French fighter jet. Ooh. So an air steward reportedly said there was nothing to worry about. And the, uh, <laughs> Did they? The <laughs> British <laughs> tourists, I know, the British tourists were on a flight home from Spain uh, and they've recalled the frightening moment a French 
fighter jet pursued their plane for 15 minutes. The French Air Force uh, tracked a plane from low-cost airline Jet 2 on its way to Birmingham from Malaga on Friday afternoon. So the uh, the actual jet in question, I think that was uh, that's a Mirage, I think that is, Nev. I think if I'm right, yes, that's a Mirage. Is, yeah. Uh, Jet 2 said they've quizzed the French aviation officials asking why the French Air Force tracked their flight LS1204. Passenger Sarah Hatfield, who was travelling with husband Ian and their 13-year-old daughter Emily, said that passengers felt a mixture of terror and excitement. Uh, She added that someone spotted the French jet and told the cabin crew who presumed uh, they told the Jet 2 pilots. Uh, Ian was terrified and it didn't help that loads of other passengers came by us to look out at the jet. Miss Hatfield from uh, Quarry Bank near Dudley said uh, of the fighter jet, it was so close I could read the writing on its tail fin. Oh dear. Uh, The bank worker whose daughter took several photos of the French warplane said it felt as if they were about to get shot down. (laughs) Now, <laughs> now, is there a possibility that this could be slightly over-exaggerated reporting by the Sun <laughs> newspaper, by any chance? It could, be, yeah, could possibly be, yeah. Okay, um, right, just I checking. Mean, but there is a great picture, anyway, of, of the picture of this yeah. particular jet which taken we can't inside share the window, which we can't show you, but trust me, <laughs> it's imagine. on the website. I just knew imagine. I forgot something. <laughs> just, just imagine looking out your uh, your passenger window and seeing this uh, Mirage fighter jet just um, right. just, yes. just literally okay. Off. Just you, there. you could virtually wave at him, okay. I think, right. out the window. Always nice. Oh, and... Obviously, your your uh, your cabin crew. Yeah. Uh, would, would you find? You? I mean, obviously, you would find this incredibly interesting. Oh, be, being I, lo- an I love this. Uh, <laughs> for me, I'd be uh, glued to the window and possibly not paying too much attention to the cabin. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, this would be uh, quite interesting. But I think I may have a bit of an answer to why. Uh, there was Ooh. these have French been, fighters. Have you been doing some research, Owen? I have a I little bit. Yes. I have a little bit. Wow. Now, there has been... Uh, no, no, we, that'll have to stop. You realise that? Well, it's, <laughs> it's not the sort of thing we, we encourage here at Plain Talk. There has UK. been yeah. uh, a little bit of, um, of an incident. The airline has remained anonymous in Ooh. the research that I was doing, so I'm okay. not exactly sure is this the incident in question. However, uh, there was a case where some procedures weren't followed uh, and Ooh. that the correct incorrect secondary radio frequency wasn't uh, wasn't input into the into the radios and that the pilots experienced uh, a, a comms failure on one of their headsets uh, okay. so as far as I know there was an aircraft there who was not in communication with air traffic control for Indeed. 30 right. minutes and this possibly could have been why um, we have a French fighter jet on the wing of a Jet 2 aircraft. Moving on to the next story, and this story would usually be Matt's, but because Matt's not got a PC in front of him, because <laughs> he's in charge of the uh, of the board today. Matt's having a special meltdown. Matt's having a yeah. meltdown. So uh, <laughs> taking over from Matt this week to do the Ryanair story, it's... Mr. Nev. Yeah, I'm, I feel very privileged to uh, talk about... <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll get over it. It's this, fine, honestly. Yeah. It's fine airline. And uh, it's on the uh, independent.ie, and it says Ryanair threatens to ban second free bag as passengers repeatedly flout rules. And it says that customers who break Ryanair's cabin baggage rules are causing summer boarding delays, the airline has said. The airline has issued a statement uh, threatening to review its free second cabin bag policy if the situation continues. Despite our repeated messages some customers are still attempting to bring larger than permitted bags on board, which are causing delays at the boarding gate, says Kenny Jacobs, its marketing officer. Many customers are repeatedly uh, exceeding our cabin baggage allowance or will be left with no choice but to review our policy should this practice continue. Under its current rules, Ryanair allows passengers to carry one normal cabin bag, which is 55 by 40 by 20 centimetres in size and 10 kilos in weight, and one additional small bag, such as a handbag, laptop, case or shopping bag on board for free. The rules are being repeatedly flouted, it says, and uh, Ryanair's free second cabin bag is one of the most popular changes introduced under its four-year Always Getting Better programme. But the airline has made several threats to review the policy following its abuse by passengers. Far too many passengers are turning up with half the contents of their homes, Ryanair CEO Michael (laughs) O'Leary said, and the airline has even produced a video illustrating how to use it, don't abuse it or lose it. 
and uh, despite the fact that it's Boeing 737 planes can carry 189 passengers, it only guarantees that the first 90 cabin bags can be, can be accommodated in overhead bins. And I did not know that. What? A recent survey by which the UK Product and Service Review site found that 26 pieces of um, sorry 26 percent of Ryanair customers are forced to put hand luggage into the hold due to space limitations. And uh, with flights operating at 97 percent capacity in the summer months, and some passengers reportedly showing up with two wheelie cases or oversized second bags like rucksacks the squeeze is clearly coming to a head and uh, it says that uh, our gate agents are rigorously enforcing our carry-on policy to avoid flight delays Jacob said and uh, the uh, he advises passengers who want guaranteed overhead bin space for their cabin bags to purchase priority boarding charged of course at <laughs> five euros per flight Bags that do not meet its size criteria will be refused or, where available, placed in the aircraft hold for a fee of £50 or €50, Euros, the airline adds. Well, how surprising is that? <laughs> but, it is, I mean, we, we cover the stories like this so often now, don't we? Where the, you know, and we've all seen it, we've all been there, we've all seen you know, passengers taking on ridiculously sized uh, hand baggage onto an aircraft. And uh, I haven't actually watched the video yet on here, but I, I'll watch it later on, I think. Um, but it does demonstrate, you know, some people's um, uh, inability to to stick to said rules. I think. Yeah. Very very simple rule. Very simple rule indeed. One trolley bag and one smaller handbag, and uh, it it causes a lot a lot of problems on board uh, my particular air airline. And uh, yeah, I think it is worth um, putting out there that. It, it, if these procedures aren't going to be followed, that they will uh, remove the the second uh, free handbag because uh, it it does delay flights. It does uh, cause a lot a lot of problems, and I suppose in any uh, airline industry, time is money. So uh, if if you're going to be delaying a flight for a particular reason, well, I think that um, privilege is just going to have to go. Mm. Yeah, I think they should they should use those frame things more often at the uh, yeah, at the yeah check in. It really needs to be enforced. because I know all the times I've I've flown flown with uh, flown with with Ryanair this uh, the airline in question here on this story, you know I've never seen anyone actually made to use those um, bag what a size kind of frame yeah. thingies. I I have been asked to use that, but I was not flying with Ryanair. <laughs> I was flying with uh, Monarch actually. Oh Monarch, <laughs> yeah. really? Oh, okay, mm. okay. So we're going to move on to the next story, and uh, this story is one for you, Owen. Now, this is from uh, at wall, uh, sorry, atwonline.com. Has, has it been finding you some special websites again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Scottish Regional Loganair to strengthen ties with British Airways. Scottish Regional Airline Loganair is in discussions with British Airways on an expanded co-chair agreement. The Glasgow-based operator is about to come to the end of a lengthy franchise agreement with Europe's largest regional airline, Flybe. It has flown in Exeter-based Flybe's colours for a decade now. Talks on renewing the agreement broke down in 2016 when the two sides were unable to agree on terms. Flybe has since gone to on to sign a franchise agreement with another UK regional, Eastern Airways, and fierce competition is expected between the groups. From the 1st of September, Logan Air will again uh, operate under its traditional colours of a black lower fuselage, red engine cowlings with a tartan tail fin, which I think is quite a nice livery. Uh, Logan Air provides air services, many of them on a public service obligation basis, the UK equivalent of the US Essential Air Service model, to a number of small airports in the Highlands and the Islands of Scotland, with a fleet of turboprop aircraft, the backbone of which is the 13 Saab 340s. It also operates five Saab 2000s, three Dorniers, uh, 328s and three DHC-6 Twin Otter Series 400s. Two Britain Norman uh, Islanders operate the ultra short routes in the Orkney and Shetland Island groups as well. Prior to its connection with Flybe, Loganair was a BA franchise operation 14 years from 1994 to 2008. The business relationship with BA continued even during the Flybe period with a co chair operation with the UK national carrier on some of Loganair's intra Scottish services. 
Logan Air and British Airways have long, a long-standing and successful relationship in serving the communities of the Scottish Highlands and Islands and we are working closely with our colleagues at British Airways to strengthen those links to benefit both airlines and more importantly to our customers, Logan Air's commercial director Kay Ryan said. Logan Air is the long-standing holder of two aviation world records. It flies the world's shortest scheduled air route, mm. a two-minute hop between the islands of Westray and Papa Westray in the Orkney Islands, and it also operates the only scheduled air service to land on a tidal beach at Barra in the Western Isles. So, um, yeah, that's good news uh, for the, we, the Scottish Islands. We covered a, we covered a Logan Air story not so long back, and that always it just sticks out that that tartan tail. Yeah, um, it's, it's is a, awesome. I love that. It's that a very, very, paint nice, on there. Uh, a very nice livery. Obviously, uh, with the ties with BA, Nev, is this something you've you'd, you'd heard about? You heard about? Uh, oh yeah, there? no, it's always good uh, to have that sort of tie-up, and of course, that's all about the regional feed into these uh, slightly further-flung airports. Uh, last time I went on, on a Logan Air flight, it was a Shorts 360, I think, in incredibly <laughs> windy conditions, flying from uh, Edinburgh <laughs> to uh, Belfast City. So the next story then is on the independent.co.uk website and uh, it's a story that uh, I can definitely uh, put my hand up and say yeah I know exactly what they're saying because the headline is only the rich can afford to be airline pilots <laughs> due to cost of training warns industry body. Right. Ooh, that got a few looks from around there. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> so students yeah. from poorer backgrounds are being put off career in flying due to the cost of training and industry bodies warn today. The British Pilot Airline Pilots Association, or BALPA, which represents over 75% of pilots in the UK, has called for airlines to take steps to ensure pilot selection is open to all. The organisation says that uh, costs of up to £100,000 to train and qualify mean that good A-level results are simply not enough for aspiring pilots, who now need to factor in financial considerations as they decide on their career path. In the past, airlines would fund flight training and those who made it onto the schemes were guaranteed a job if they successfully passed all their exams. However, this has changed in the last few decades and the burden of costs has increasingly fallen to the student pilots who have to pay f uh, to qualify, um, often with no promises of a job at the end. Uh, Balpa reports that the sparring pilots say this has led to a two-tier system which less talented but richer students are able to train while those from poorer backgrounds are put off by the prospect of huge debts. The association is calling on airlines and decision makers to ensure pilots from less advantaged backgrounds are not put off uh, the career. It says the selection must be based on ability to do the job and not on the ability to pay. Wendy Purdy of Balpa's Head of Membership and Career Services said, unfortunately many aspiring pilots who have worked hard to get top-notch A-level qualifications will fall by the wayside because they are unable to fund their training. We believe this financial burden has a real impact on pilots and a wider repercussions for the aviation industry. Pilot contracts are changing and the big salaries associated with being a pilot are fast disappearing. There are some contracts out there for low hours pilots which barely pay enough to uh, live on, let alone cover the costs of training. Whilst we don't want to put anyone off a pilot career, we must ensure our future pilot members are ent uh, entering the industry with their eyes wide open. We believe more needs to be done to ensure fresh talent is supported early in their career. Well, that's why Balpa launched its next gen project to give trainees a voice and lobby the government and airlines to do more to ensure recruitment is based on talent and not who has the deepest pockets. Very true, I think. Um, you know, it should be open to all um, of pilot training. I mean, I know from various conversations that we that we have on on a, on a regular basis. I mean, it's and from your own experiences, Carlos. I mean, it's not a cheap hobby. There's no, no. two ways about it, is it? it? It is, and it is so obviously much cheaper to do something like learn to fly in the states. And the story is right. You know, there are probably a lot of people out, a lot of guys and girls out there who are probably incredibly good at. Uh, yeah. uh, probably practical who would make flying, amazing pilots. who would make amazing yeah. pilots but just have not got that financial yeah. background to, to put themselves yeah. in, that, one of those in that place yeah, yeah. yeah. It's but a shame. i mean there are all, there are on the on the the flip side to that if you do want to get into aviation as a hobby we were, we were talking to uh, microlight pilots uh, earlier today that's yeah, true yeah. And, uh, we were. 
that's a, a lot more cost effective and a lot more yeah. uh, a lot less cost prohibitive there's also gliding which is a fantastic yeah, way to get into flying gliding as a as a way of, of uh, getting close to the real thing yeah yeah <laughs> i mean <laughs> you can't really get much closer to nature than that can you no no um, just just so gliding that's a very natural air, yeah. uh, uh, that's a very Indeed. natural way of flying yeah did we all watch the EasyJet program? No. I haven't watched it yet. Yeah, yeah so I watched it on Catch Up. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, and oh. please, a thorough review be would be much appreciated. Oh, it makes me angry. Oh, dear. Oh. It's a little bit superficial, I think. It's a little... What, do you, you mean a program made by ITV that is purely about <laughs> ratings oh. might possibly have a... A, a controversial and sensational background. There was certainly some premium advertising <laughs> slots in there, and oh, I did yeah. think there was more advertising in that hour than normal. Actually, it was right. rather. Oh, it must have been look, a proper, but, uh, popular uh, program. Oh yeah, so uh, we'll have to see about that. Uh, so moving on to the next story, and uh, this one's for you, Nev. Yeah, it's in the uh, Detroit News, and it says that your tiny economy airline may soon stop shrinking. Every so often, officials at Rockwell Collins. Um, uh, pitch a one-day job offer to residents near its Winston, Northern Carolina uh, design centre. Earn $100 for sitting in an aeropla- aeroplane seat for eight hours. Show up for the gig and there's rarely a drinks cart or flight attender in, uh, in sight. The rows of seats are arrayed in a testing area at the company's design and engineering complex. Even without engine hum or overhead bins, it's like they're really on the plane, says Alex Potsy, <laughs> uh, Vice President of Research and Development at the company's campus there. Over the years, the the seat researchers at BE Aerospace, which Rockwell acquired in April for $8 billion, have gleaned a few insights about life in the air. Most people are just fine for two hours. As the third hour approaches, though, stiffness increases, oh, hello, and uh, comfort declines. <laughs> the soundboard is never here when you want no, to hear it. That's what she said. Uh, at four hour family show. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry, I'm the one being told off. That makes a joke. Wow. Uh, uh, the ir- irony is complete, yes, isn't indeed, it? Really? Yes. Uh, at four hours, however, a sort of derriere detente is achieved. Pardon. Yes, that's a uh, new vocabulary for me. <laughs> yeah, and did. the levels of discomfort recede. After all, when you're stuck in a inside a sealed speeding tube at 35,000 feet, resistance is truly futile. But there are many <laughs> reasons to despise flying, from delays to fees to overzealous TSA staff. But shrinking seats and the pain, claustrophobia and rage they can trigger are arguably the biggest reasons why travellers loathe airlines. The modern seat with its power pack, uh, sorry, power two pack, more customers, (laughs) uh, perhaps I was right the first time, uh, onto any given plane is at the very heart of the industry's 21st century economics. Slimmer seats and less leg room between rows, uh, known as pitch, has enabled cabin uh, Identification across domestic, uh, domestic and international fleets. More seats, quite simply, mean more money and lower operating costs. Wow. And uh, when the Boeing uh, company introduced the Twin Isle 777 Boeing. in the uh, mid 1990s, a nine seat breadth was standard. Now the aircraft flown by carriers worldwide often has 10 seats across in economy, making life even more miserable for passengers. Boeing's 787 Dreamline has become notorious for its economy class pinch, with nine across seating and on some 787s they're only 17 inches wide. Uh, The cabin squeeze and seat shrinking has helped increase earnings in an industry that's gotten used to fiscal stability, but it occasionally results in some bad public relations. Two United passengers got in a, into a kerfuffle in the summer of 2014 when a man stuck a knee defender device on the seat <laughs> in front of him to prevent reclining, Whoa. causing the seat's occupant to grow irate. The crew diverted the Denver, Denver uh, bound flight to Chicago to eject both combatants. Well, that's that's uh, when it gets to that point, then yeah. y- you know you've gone. I, mean, uh, I, I mean, I said yeah. this before. I mean, because w- I did uh, m- many years ago, I did a flight to um, New Zealand and uh, and on that leg, and the, like the the, the, sh- the air stewardess showed me because the lady in front of me reclined her seat immediately, and so the air stewardess showed me how to recline my seat, but they wouldn't, it wouldn't go, and it was because the guy behind me was holding the seat, preventing it from going. There's, there's a certain um, etiquette involved, I think. With this. There, yeah, there really is. Well. I mean, like, yeah. uh, for me, definitely you don't recline during the meal service. Yeah. And definitely I not. Can, you definitely don't um, recline. I completely when you understand why more and more airlines are literally stopping their aircraft, like the seats, from reclining. 
Yeah, 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 I, I do too. And it, it really, especially on the short haul routes where you don't need um, no. to recline. No. You're only a couple of hours, as you say, but I suppose it's going back to that story, though. It's like once you get to three hours, I mean, yeah. you, you do yeah. need to stretch out or, or whatever, don't you? It's, uh, yeah, what we need is aeroplanes with gyms. I think that's the next, yeah. that's yeah. The next answer. Well, I yeah. think the answer to that has become cabin crew. <laughs> you can walk around, you can walk around the that. airplane as much as yeah. you like. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that I have neither the look or build for it but nevertheless <laughs> you never know <laughs> yeah yeah it's a sorry state of affairs they must be really desperate for cabin crew when yeah, they start so. looking at, <laughs> looking at me yeah. anyway okay who's with the next story the next one is for you owen um so the next one is from the uk the dot business insider dot com and its headline is this boeing jet is a luxury cruise ship for the sky this month the boutique cruise line Crystal Cruises added a new vessel to its fleet but the vessel named Crystal Sky isn't the company's traditional cruise ship riverboat or luxury yacht instead it's a new Boeing 777-200 LR world liner wide body jet and that's right you can now tour the world on board a private luxury jet courtesy of Crystal Air Cruises oh, how about that <laughs> Crystal Sky beautifully complements all things Crystal with exclusively style design and custom experience as she will offer guests, Crystal's president and CEO Eddie Rodriguez said in a statement. As a global luxury m traveller myself, I have been privileged to travel uh, aboard some of the world's finest aircraft and there is nothing like Crystal Sky around the world. I, I think that's a slightly biased statement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you possibly, like, you know, going for some advertising. Yeah, a little bit. Do you, yep. do you think you're right? Yep. Yeah, okay. yeah, a little bit. Right. Uh, the Crystal Skies interior is the work of Greenpoint Technologies with the installation completed at its Moses Lake, Washington facility. Our goal for this program was to create a luxurious interior showcasing the elegant brand Crystal established with their cruise ships, yachts and river boats. Greenpoint Technologies Executive Vice President Brett Neely said in a statement. It was amazing to see the combined core team come together to focus on Crystal's guest experience, resulting in the beautiful and functional interior we see today. Crystal Air Cruises, a subsidiary of leisure travel giant Genting Hong Kong, expects to deploy the Boeing 777 as both a flying cruise ship and a private charter for the ultra-wealthy, as well as corporations and sports teams. The Boeing 777-200LR has a list price of $320.7 million and that's before the millions of dollars Crystal poured into the interior conversion. So here's a cr uh, closer look at the Crystal Sky. Now because uh, we can't show you the pictures I'm just going yeah. to... Uh, so basically what we'll do is we'll make sure we put this link to the story in the show notes yeah. uh, and then you can have a look at these but it, honestly guys it is worth having a look at the, these pictures it is... It, it, it yeah. almost doesn't look like an airliner inside yeah. because I mean we have seen some extravagant interiors in aircraft before yeah. but this this has kind of tables, like actual round, like restaurant tables and chairs. Well, what I say um, is, if you imagine uh, the the lobby of uh, a very, mm, very posh yeah. hotel, hotel. Um, right. and maybe yeah. the, 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 sky. the small bars that they have in, in some of these posh hotels, there's a lot of artwork on the, uh, on the cabinets. There's uh, some beautiful, beautiful first-class... Uh, seats, uh, like so fully reclining seats. So, um, so how many people? Uh, is it just like? <laughs> is it just like like you literally privately hire the aeroplane to go wherever it is that you want? And it's yeah. Like so it says of, um, it's a camper van, but in the sky. <laughs> I mean, a posh camper van. A posh in the sky. camper van. Right, okay. So this yeah. says. Well, uh, I don't know. Excuse me. My caravan, I'll have you know, is first class living all the way. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 I can vouch for that. <laughs> now this says uh, the cabin has room for 88 flat beds that can each be converted into uh, 70.5 inch beds. So that's okay. that's quite a lot. Quite leg room. Yeah, um, <laughs> in, in stark contrast to the last story. And do we know how many people can actually go on, you know, so how many of your friends can you bring with you? Well, uh, 88 <laughs> flatbed seats. Um, right. So that's, so that, 88, that's, just, 88 that's, people that, that's yeah. just the people, the, uh, the passengers, and I'm sure... <laughs> A I don't know. If, I don't know about twelve. I don't know if cohabiting is, oh is allowed. Dear. What are you laughing about? Oh, uh, just know? Captain Al in the chat room has oh. just said, "Does it look like the inside of um, Spearmint Rhino?" 
I don't know what that is. Anybody know what that is here? It's S- some um, confectionery item. On is it? Yeah, <laughs> I think it's a, a, it's a chew, a packet of chew sweets. Is it? Yeah. Good news. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Each uh, seat is equipped with 24-inch entertainment screen and complimentary Wi-Fi. Really? Oh, I should hope so too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the passengers will even have access to a butler. There's also uh, a ooh. full-time executive chef right. on the flight. Okay. And uh, the crystal even promises a Michel- Michelin star quality dining experience. Right. Now, I think if you have, if you can promise that there's a Michelin star experience, yes. I think you might yeah. have to have a Michelin star, star. first. Yes. Maybe a Michelin star chef at least. Maybe Perhaps. at least, yeah, yeah. Maybe at least. So we'll yeah. we'll wonder yeah. who yeah. that is. So what's is. a Michelin star experience? It's you know, it's just, <laughs> you know, the restaurant looks really nice, but uh, you know, it's still bangers and mash at the end of the day. Yeah, the bathroom <laughs> looks incredible. Mount marble countertops, you know, a, a, a beautiful mirror with lights all around it, and uh, they're saying all of this isn't cheap, as you might well imagine. Yes. Air cruises on board the Crystal Sky reportedly cost as much as a hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars per person okay. well, for an around the world trip I, really? I think that's enough advertising for this particular company <laughs> yeah we should probably they, they just put this one to sleep and say we will never never ever, ever, ever yeah. go on this know. particular you know, aircraft a few more patreon people who knows yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think if, we, if any of us become uh, this rich i think we'll be all getting our pilot's licenses I first so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so that we can yeah. fly this we'll just plane. buy our own Cessnas <laughs> and bomb around in those yeah. Yeah. you know what that will be just as much yeah, fun yeah absolutely or maybe live just shows t- from the sky yeah, yeah. Oh, that's for next I oh, don't that is the dream that is the dream <laughs> so moving um, on but Nev I mean I, 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 I may oh. need to talk to your tech guys about how we do that in the sky on the moon oh yeah, <laughs> yeah I yeah. think the CAA have a bit of an opinion about uh, live broadcasting from uh, from the air but you never know do they you? I mean, uh, that's you why know. Um, you know when they used to do the, the, the weather reports and so on in uh, uh, in small uh, twin prop um planes yeah. around London yeah. and that sort of stuff um, the, the quality really wasn't very good because they weren't allowed to actually put out very high, high uh, output oh, I see. Uh, that may have changed now do though, you know what so. you know every day is a school day isn't it yeah. Yeah. the learning <laughs> learning so moving on to the next story this one is on the kirklandreporter.com and uh, the headline is incredible Boeing Everett site turns 50 years young So in May 1967, Boeing employees moved into a factory built beside Payne Field near Everett in Washington. Thirteen months later, the group that became known in aerospace legend as the Incredibles rolled out the 747. Uh, A half century later, approximately 40,000 employees, customers and suppliers visit uh, Boeing's largest manufacturing site daily. The hub of Widebody Factories is home of the 747-8, the 767, 777, 787 Dreamliner and the KC-46 Tanker and several derivative programs. Uh, Building renovations and new construction tell a tale of continuous improvement and transformation including the 1.3 million square foot composite wing centre as today's production system prepares for the 777X. As the company this month commemorates 50 years of Team Everett's contributions, uh, those uh, changes reflect Boeing's continued investment in uh, the region. Uh, Company leaders say several employees who joined the Everett site in 1960 added their unique perspectives uh, about the past and future. Uh, The 777X represents a tremendous commitment and 787 and our freighters as well are positioned. Customers love them, said Bill Reed-Turk, a manager on the 767 Tanker program who joined Boeing right out of college in 1966. He believes the site's future is bright. Uh, If we can keep other programs going, it looks like the company will be uh, be building planes in Everett uh, for quite some time, he said. uh, the, incredi- the Incredibles legacy uh, they inherited employees reflected on those first years at the site. Boeing was briefing a lot of people in the company. Uh, Patricia Walters, a technical designer on the 767 program, recalled of the ramp up to support the 747. It also seemed that there were days or always adding onto the factory and making the building bigger to accommodate the newest airplanes. Wu Li, who works on the 747 program, was employed Say that again. <laughs> no, I didn't sign in any So Wu Li, who <laughs> works on the 747 program, was employed at Boeing site in Renton in 1966 when the company announced plans to build the Everett site. Uh, he, invol- he volunteered and got a job uh, doing operational planning for the 747 scheduling and has been there ever since, he said, uh, calling first flights and VIP visits 
the highlights of his time in Everett's. So Boeing's current market outlook forecasts that 9,100 new wide-body aircraft will be needed over the next two decades, a $2.8 trillion opportunity. Employees and leaders said the 777X and other wide-body programs, coupled with a sharp focus on quality and affordability, will help the companies compete, ensuring the likelihood of ever hosting more flights and VIP visits. Now the picture they've got uh, on this particular site, the KirklandReporter.com, if you go to that website you'll see uh, there's an awesome picture of uh, the 747, that's the city of Everett and uh, that um, took flight, first took flight on in 1968 on the 29th of September. There's a lovely picture of it here with uh, all the uh, Boeing employees standing in front. That's a lovely picture that one isn't mm, it? Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So moving on to the next story, and this one is for you, Nev. It's on the uh, traveller.com.au website, so it's an Australian one. And uh, this is all about, they asked the question, how many aircraft are there in the world right now? I've often wondered that, Nev. How many have disappeared? Oh, this yeah. is a very interesting article. Well, any any ideas, any other guess well, before we start? Well, I would like to think there are a lot of aircraft I'm in the world. I'm going to guess a ballpark figure of about 30,000. Okay, all right. Mm. Well, let's see how we get Matt? on. Oh, uh, Matt's uh, lost listening. interest. <laughs> so, uh, okay, Matt, Matt says there's, there's I was six. talking to Vic. Sorry. I'm very sorry. Oh, I'm really sorry. Matt, how many aircraft do you think there are in the world right now? What, flying or in or like sat on the ground? and all Flying? Sort of? Flying, in, yeah, in, yeah. in flight. In the flight, air, air at weather. this very oh. moment. Commercial, is that, is that the commercial big commercial jets. No, no, how many, do, how many exist? How many exist that fly at the moment? What do you think? I'm going to say 290,000. Okay. Um, Carry on, Nev. Carl, how many, do, how many do you think? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to read the story and get the answer. No, 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 but no, I, no, I'd no, imagine... no. Wrong, Carl. It's not always oh, Carl. about you. <laughs> oh, Carl. Yes, our, our, our last cameraman. Since when have we called you Carl? That is weird, yeah. <laughs> Carl, how many... We did at my wedding. How, how um, many active aircraft do you think there are flying in the world right now? 80,000. 80, mm. So Carl says 80,000. Let's yeah. see what the Go answer on, is. Okay. Well, the answer, ladies and gentlemen, is that the total number of aircraft currently in service is approximately 23,600. I may, I may have overshot the bar a bit then. <laughs> well, <laughs> just <laughs> no just change there then. <laughs> uh, but that does include passenger and cargo aircraft, and it oh. reckons that they are, they are 2,500 more in storage. Another wow. estimate on the Aviation Enthusiast website, airliners.net, includes all commercial and military planes, but not light aircraft, and they claim that there's some uh, 39,000 planes in the world, and that is over the course of history, and of course there have actually been more than 150,000. So uh, quite a lot of aircraft, but according to the website, that's not nearly enough, and uh, ICAO uh, says that the global air transport network doubles in size at least once every 15 years, and it's expected to do so again by 20 2030. That's about half past eight. Uh, Boeing, one of the. Um, I'm just going to have to wait for the last, can't I? Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Boeing. I know it's the satellite delay, Nev. That's what it is. Yeah. And yeah. together it will be seamless. The uh, Boeing, one of the world's biggest aircraft manufacturers, agrees. It says that there's a need for 39,620 new planes over the next 20 years. So by 2037, there should be 6, 000, sorry, 63,220 aircraft in the world, minus older ones that have slipped out of service. Our forecast is based on a combination of airline growth and replacement of older, less efficient airplanes. A spokesman said there's no doubt passenger demand will continue to grow at a healthy clip. That's a very... Uh, Australian uh, clip term. <laughs> what? Um, so, just a, a quick uh, summary then of American Airlines. Um, by revenue, they are the largest, forty billion, forty point nine nine billion dollars in 2014-2015. By passenger carried, uh, one hundred and forty six. Uh, uh, million five hundred and thirty thousand in 2015. Uh, the fleet size is impressive at 1,789 aircraft, and the number of destinations that they serve is 350. But by number of countries served, it's Turkish Airlines at 117. Uh, so that's uh, pretty substantial. And um, just looking down the the list of how many people fly each year, just the last sort of three or four years, uh, 2014 has been 3.33 billion, 2015 3.57 billion, and 2016 3.77 billion. So uh, clearly the trend is upwards. Definitely. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, that's a, an insane amount of aircraft that they're predicting to have in uh, in the skies uh, by in the next uh, few years or so. Yeah. Still but nowhere near the 200 and something other thousand that <laughs> I thought. 290,000. Yeah, yeah. But also, yeah. think think about all those aircraft that are, are, are currently in working condition but stored yeah. in the yeah. Mojave Desert yeah. because yeah, yeah, there yeah. is a lot of aircraft right. stored there. Okay. And there's even... I was reading a report online a few weeks back. There are some brand new aircraft that are actually stored in the Mojave Desert. Really? Yeah. yeah which haven't, insane, haven't, even got, haven't even got a few miles on the clock. Those poor aircraft. Yeah, yeah. I know. Oh dear. I feel so there sorry. There will be a mourning campaign start now. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's very distressed about So moving that. on to the next story, Owen. This one is for you. So uh, this one is from flightglobal.com. And Ooh. it says, passenger device source... Uh, Passenger device, source of seat fire on Lufthansa A380. Uh-oh. Canadian investigators have disclosed that a passenger electronic power bank was the source of a fire in the cabin of a Lufthansa Airbus A380 operating to Houston. The aircraft transporting 510 occupants has been, uh, had been cruising in Canadian airspace some 260 nautical miles northeast of Montreal when the crew was alerted to heavy electrical smoke and fire beneath seat 10C says Transport Safety Board of Canada. The incident bulleting on the 2nd of August uh, incident states that a passenger, a passenger power bank, a battery-powered portable device for providing electrical supply, was the source and was stuck in the seat mechanism. Three fire extinguishers were used by cabin crew to smother the fire. No emergency was declared and the aircraft Delta Alpha India Mike India has since returned to service following seat repair. And uh, that is about all that's said about that. But um, I think power banks are is something that popular everyone has everyone's on board one. these days. Matt's got one. I have. I, in fact, I'm using it right he's, now. He's using it right now. <laughs> I've, I've got one. Yeah. I think Nev, do you, yeah. do you use the power banks? The little um, I do. Yes. Power bricks. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. yeah. I have oh, three. Oh, I guess like Owen has three. I have. Yeah. <laughs> I have three that I carry on board, right, okay. uh, as well as another one that I have at home. Uh, and also, I know that many airlines now sell them on board as part really? of their duty-free products. So you carry batteries on board? God, blimey. Well, you see, That's for a bed. Thought, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we, we carry these, uh, these portable batteries. Now, obviously, anything that we sell on board has been approved by oh, yes. various different... Uh, Various different uh, aviation sorry, authorities. Owen, you're not alone. Shorty says that he's got three himself. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, exactly. So perhaps we're the ones in the minority. I mean, I just bought one that <laughs> that'll do everything. You know. Yeah, I've got I've <laughs> got one of the uh, the massive power bricks. I've got yeah. uh, a five thousand milliamp one. I've got a one thousand milliamp one yeah. as well. And uh, yeah, that's the that's the power brick that Matt has, and I've got yeah. a, one that's slightly bigger than that. Um, but I. They, There's they are a little I, bit. Really, uh, you're going to let him get away with that? That surely, and what, what? That's what she said. Moment, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wondering who would notice. No, moving on. Uh, <laughs> Captain Al is never around when you need him, is he? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Actually, we thought he was flying in today when we saw the. Yeah, uh, we did. The, we uh, saw a little Piper Twenty Eight. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, uh, no, I must. I must say, one of the things that does surprise me is because I, I do think a lot of this has been about um, quality. Isn't it? I mean, it's like these battery packs because I, I think was it mm. EE, one of the mobile phone company, oh, companies yeah. here in the yeah. UK, gave away a load of power bricks, and they, there was a massive recall done uh, on them because they like they were literally bursting into flames. They were shorting out and, and just sort of going wrong. So whether it was you know, I, I, yeah, but I, I will say this much: if you're putting a <laughs> if you're dropping a battery into a seat mechanism, it's probably not, not going okay. to be a good yeah. idea. Yeah. Yeah. no matter how good the quality yeah, is. The, yeah. A lot of if these, crush a lot it, of yeah. these thermal runaways have been caused by the, these batteries and phones and mm. tablets and stuff being crushed yeah, as right. people recline their seats yeah. or. Um, move and their seats. it is something that um, is being brought to our attention um, mm. yeah. as crew. I mean, we we are told that uh, we need to do security checks to check for exactly things like these. Now yeah. we are lucky in that um, at my airline we don't have seats that recline or that have too much of a mechanism in okay. them. Yeah. Uh, so there's very little that it can get stuck in uh, yeah. that moves that might uh, might crush well, a battery mean, it, 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 that being said it's still important to find these things if they if but, they are on board but in so many cases surely a lot of it is purely and simply a lot of the, a lot of the the airline seats and things you're actually charging phones from the airplane 
Because a lot of them have sockets, don't they, where you can plug yeah. in yeah, USB yeah, sockets. Yeah. Or is it just yeah, power posh supplies? Sheets? I mean, no, the last yeah. time I was flying with uh, Delta Airlines, they had ones in all of their economies uh, right. seats. And that I mean, was on a USB an port. I mean, then that immediately mm. solves the problem, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, so you, you, you can then easily say you're not allowed to bring your, uh, your battery pack on board, but bring the power lead you can charge it off yeah. the yeah that, off that the might be a very good idea yeah. however you're still going to have people bring them in their uh, in their luggage which i don't know whether which would yeah, be a, a better, better idea yeah. would it be better to have it in the cabin where, where it's monitored where it's well yeah. a monitored and b where they've got people who can put it the fire out well yeah, yeah. Uh, where you've got crew who can deal with this sort I mean, of situation what, I, mean, I presume there's smoke detectors and things in in the luggage hold are there oh yes, yeah, there. yeah yeah and yeah. fire suppression yeah. systems yeah. and all that sort of thing yeah. but uh yeah well, that sounds like fun. Well, hello there. We've got <laughs> a uh, we've got a visitor okay. to the stall. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. Where's the best place to watch the, oh, the, place flight, to watch though, the display? We'll ask the listeners around <laughs> the globe. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure people in New Zealand will know. No, the, um, that, the best uh, place if you yeah. if you if you walk down here and turn and turn and just keep walking and you'll see the flight line and there's uh, there's a kind of place to stand there's loads of there. there's loads of people yeah. down there you'll see all the chairs and stuff <laughs> <laughs> great no, interaction with yeah, uh, with the public exactly. yeah, fantastic <laughs> that's it that's our good deed done for the day yeah. I, know. <laughs> yeah, I know we're good, we're good. <laughs> we can all rest easy now we've done our good deed for the day um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so uh, moving next, I think this me is it me next is it I me? no yep. idea yeah, yeah, think, yeah. 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 so moving next on to the next story is on flight global site and the headline is FAA change Changes San Francisco uh, San Francisco landing procedures after A320 near miss. Uh, this is a story that's been making the rounds across uh, the globe. This was uh, regarding an Air Canada. So they're A320. just saying in the chat room there. It's officially the PT UK information booth. information. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Customer information. Yes. Yeah. Um, this uh, yeah this story's been making the rounds uh, for quite some time now, and it was it was it could have been an incredibly serious uh, event. I think you'll agree, Nev. This was uh, this made big news, and the Federal Aviation Administration has modified nighttime landing procedures and control tower staffing requirements at San Francisco International Airport oh. following a close call uh, last month involving an Air Canada Airbus A320. Controllers at the airport will no longer permit pilots to perform visual approaches at night when an adjacent parallel runway is closed, uh, the agency tells Flight Global. Uh, when these conditions prevail, our controllers issue pilots instrument landing system approaches or satellite-based approaches which help pilots line up for the correct runway, says the FAA in a statement. The agency adds that San Francisco Tower management now requires two controllers to be working in tower until late night arrival rush hours are over. The changes took effect right after a July the 7th incident during which an Air Canada A320 operating flight 759 from Toronto nearly landed on a busy taxiway at San Francisco, the FAA said. Controllers had cleared the pilots to land on runway 28 right, but they lined up on the parallel taxiway C, which four aircraft occupied at the time, including United Airlines Boeing 787, according to the NTSB and air traffic control recordings. The A320 pilots overflew the taxiway by about 0.25 nautical miles before controllers ordered it to go around. Uh, they then descended to a minimum altitude above the taxiway of 59 feet and passed within 29 feet laterally of one aircraft and 100 feet above two others, according to US and Canadian investigators. Uh, the, at the time of the incident, uh, San Francisco's runway 28 left was closed uh, and unlit. And the pilots of uh, the Air Canada A320 told US investigators that they thought the lighted runway was 28 left and that taxiway C was runway 28 right, and the NTSB uh, said in the report. Um, I mean, this, this, could, this, 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 everyone has agreed that this was potentially could have been the worst single aviation disaster. Yeah, this could have been ever. even worse this than could have Tenerife. Been worse. And um, there's been a huge amount of. Um, to and fro and banter and stuff on on the various podcasts and sites and stuff about uh, this, but I I think the last thing I heard was that the pilots you know they have been um, told off told off yeah, yeah <laughs> to put it uh, to put it Liz easily. actually just said in the chat room here she says as a Canadian I personally feel very ashamed whenever this story is discussed 
Yeah, I yeah. think that the, what's happened here is that, uh, I mean, luckily, uh, the, the two pilots obviously decided between them quite late on <laughs> in the approach, it has to be said, that the picture did not look right in front of them. Um, mm. Nonetheless, uh, they would have seen that a, a long way out, I think. And I think to start having those that conversation, you know, at the so, time so they had to, yeah, was yeah. Uh, pretty reckless, I've got to say. Yeah. However, um, putting thing, things about the, uh, the pilots aside, it's great to see that the aviation industry... Um, um, is very proactive and very well. Hmm, very, very good at being retroactive. But uh, I think it's being very proactive here by um, by implementing these new rules straight away, uh, without too much hesitation. And a month later, we've got uh, reports out, and it's 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 all moved quite quickly, which is a really really positive thing. And yeah. it is it is a good thing that these things are being taken really really seriously, um, and that changes have been made. Uh, I think the I, I think it's 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 for the better that they've the, these uh, these these rules now not letting the the visual um, uh, approaches being to be flown while there's only one runway in use. I think that's a, a very good idea. It, the the incident has highlighted uh, some of the problems with San Francisco, but I think uh, I think those problems have been uh, fairly well addressed by this incident. So yeah. a, a lot of good has come out of this incident. I think it's going to prevent it uh, from happening ever again in the future. And let's hope that nothing of this scale ever does happen again. So the next story then, Nev. It's a this one is quite interesting I think it is yeah, yeah. and um, it's on the independent website and um, it says that um, if you want to you know you hate queuing for flights we can now buy your own airport in Sweden what yes <laughs> yeah Ooh, hear honestly me out. hear me out a house with its own private airstrip has come up for sale and with record-breaking delays and long queue times at European airports this summer the best way to beat the crush may be to buy your own a man in western Sweden is selling an airport that he built himself 25 miles away from Gothenburg and as an added bonus the landing strip comes with two aircraft hangars and a house Shell Bradforce decided to sell the property technically classified as a private airstrip due to his age speaking to the local uh, Bradforce said there was nothing there when I bought it. I flew over the land with a friend one summer and thought it would be a really nice place for a landing strip. So I contacted the owner, bought the land and then built a house and a three kilometre landing strip. I didn't build it to be an airport. I built it for me and my son to begin with. I'm a bit older now so I thought it was time to move on. Uh, Cattleburg uh, Airport is on sale for 20 million kroner which is just under 2 million pounds and there's been no shortage of offers but Bratforce who runs a bed and breakfast with, from the profit property has some strict conditions on who he is prepared to sell to <laughs> he said finding someone to buy it isn't difficult but I want it to be bought by someone who will continue its legacy I don't want it to be destroyed and then someone something else built on it it's a fantastic place there are so many people who have met my requirements he says and the estate agency has become a little bit tired of me maybe I've said no to flying schools flying clubs and things like that I hope it goes to someone who wants to live there and fly a bit that's my dream scenario a family may be that will establish themselves there and befriend the neighbours. So uh, that's uh, pretty interesting, isn't it? Is, that yeah. will be a really, really oh, no. nice place to live. That would be absolutely <laughs> incredible. I, I can think of three people that are not a million... In fact, actually, to be honest, four people who aren't a million of miles away mm. from me right now <laughs> who would all love that house. And you know what? <laughs> and actually, of land. compared to uh, Gothenburg Airport, which is uh, Lambetter, which is, the, um, which is the one that the airlines fly into, it's actually about the same distance away from Gothenburg. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, it would be qu quite a handy. It's, it's only yeah, 20, nice. 25 yeah. kilometres. The, the Gothenburg airport is only about 20, 25 kilometres away from the, uh, from the, from the city. So I, I think it would be good for commuting There's as well. genuinely no way that I don't think it, that they'd ever sell it to someone like Harpjet, I'm afraid. I think, I think as, a, as a base. I don't, is, I don't think that would happen. It's, oh, God, it's, no. it's a great talking Perish point. The top, but I think I would like to purchase this. Well, there is that. Yeah. <laughs> but you've, got, you've got a cool £2 million pounds or 80 bazillion kroner or whatever it's just lying around but can you, that, can you imagine <laughs> imagine the chat down the pub you know uh, on, a, on a Friday night you know uh, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm flying into uh, you know such and such airport tomorrow okay yeah, any restrictions no it's my airport no, I do what I like <laughs> oh okay <Yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, do, do that, like. that would be a very. very <laughs> I think I probably would build a pub on there. I'd, st- <laughs> I'd still have. I'd still build my own weather spoons inside. I think. Yeah. <laughs> it, would, it would put a whole new meaning to the hundred dollar hamburger. Yeah, yeah, like, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The oh, expensive cup of coffee. Yeah. But you know, what? it's great that uh, he's he, the the person who's selling this on is now um, quite picky yeah. about who's selling it to because oh, yeah, it, it does it, it does um, mean that more people, uh, more community based aviation will happen there, which is yeah. a, a very very good thing. And I suppose days like these, uh, seething is really what that is. Are really uh, brings to light what that's all about. So I think there's a, a really nice idea that he's 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 only going to sell to people who are going to be yeah, good, good part of that nice community. It make, makes you feel a warm and fuzzy inside. Yeah. yeah, and I think on that warm and fuzzy feeling, and because yes. I don't have the ability to open the next story. Okay. Yeah, we are going to bring the I commercial news segment to okay. a close. I think that's a good idea. Um, but uh, we have got a, uh, a special. Um, segment uh, from a certain chap who's sitting next to me here, Nev. Uh, obviously, the passenger experience segments are going down an absolute storm with the listeners. They're all thoroughly enjoying them. We've had some great feedback um, from the listeners about uh, about the segments. So, what have we got to look forward to this week? Yeah, I'm really pleased that people like them, and I've, I've tried to, you know, interview a, a variety of, of, of different people just to uh, uh, get their opinion. This is, a, a, I think, a quite nice one. Uh, I worked with uh, Jackie at the company she was working uh, with uh, for many, many years in, in Sweden, and uh, she's done a lot of flying over the years, but of course, most recently, she's been doing a lot of flying with Harpjet, and of course, there's been some, you know, negativity in the past, but uh, she is a power user of this airline, I would say and uh, it makes for very interesting listening so here we go hello everyone it's Nev here again with another Nev's passenger experience segment this week I had the pleasure of speaking with a lady who is what I would call a serial harp jet user with mainly positive experiences I have to say Jackie was a work colleague of mine for many years and since 1988 she's lived in Sweden where I also used to work until the late 1990s She's originally from Burton-on-Trent in Staffordshire and Jackie has brought up her family in Sweden and uses the airline a great deal, both for business and leisure. Harpjet really has made the difference for her in that she can hop backwards and forwards to the UK for very little money. But, of course, you need to play by the Harpjet rules and I would certainly consider her an expert in this field. We talked on a Skype call together and I began by asking her when she first started to use Harpjet. Oh, as soon as they started flying from and to Sweden, from the UK, because it just made such a huge difference to my uh, budget, because uh, flying with SAS was expensive and not that easy because you had to get yourself to a a bigger airport. So as soon as Harpjet started flying to and from Sweden, I started using them because it made such a big difference to my my budget, my economy. Um, Flying with SAS was bit out of the way getting to the airport and also incredibly expensive then mm, i mean yeah. prices of prices have obviously come down with them as well and klm flies now from where i'm based but um earlier in the like early 90s or mid 90s when they started i presume i think uh hopjet started about 94 mm, maybe yeah I, remember I, that? I remember that yeah and of course you live almost right in the middle of sweden in the south yeah. don't you so yeah. how far is your nearest sort of harpjet connection as it were it's exactly one and a half hours uh, driving because I drove there this morning in fact to drop off members of the family to fly Hopjet otherwise the the nearest biggest airport is a good three hour drive away yes yeah, so I've I've done that drive myself many times yeah. in, in the yeah. old days so I, yeah. I know exactly what you mean and what about the the passenger experience what's it like I mean I've only fly, flown Hopjet once you've flown it a lot tell me all about it yeah, well, I must say it's got a lot better recently, the last couple of years, because I think the, the staff have probably gone on some sort of, like, uh, you know, learn how to treat your customer course, which they hadn't done before, uh, especially the staff who measure your bags, that sort of thing, because you don't really get that anymore. I mean, I'm paying not very much money. I don't expect to be able to stretch out my legs or put my chair back very far. Well, you get what you're paying for. Yeah, and of course, it's all, I mean, mainly short haul sectors, really, isn't it? It's sort of two, three, I mean, four hours maximum, probably flying time, I, I would imagine, to, to almost wherever you want to go. Um, but the thing I've noticed as well is that their route network has extended uh, massively over the last few years as well. So actually, from where you are, you can get to uh, almost anywhere in Europe w- without too much trouble, can't you? Yeah, yeah, more or less. I do tend to fly the same sort of routes all the time. I fly mainly back and forth to the UK. 
Uh, but this morning, like I said, I dropped off my kids to fly to Montenegro. We'd never, they'd never gone there unless it was a Ryanair destination. Um, we've flown with them, or well, I'll be flying with them uh, soon to Malta. Probably wouldn't have gone there if I'd had to make all the, the trip all the way up to Orlando or to Gothenburg. So yeah, uh, it makes a difference to where you're actually flying. Yeah, now you are an experienced lady on this airline. Uh, you've got some you know, very good tips, haven't you, about how to get the, the best experience in terms of luggage and all the rest of it. H how do you go about planning for a harp jet flight? <laughs> um, I make sure I check that they haven't changed the rules since the last time I flew. Oh, sure, that has happened that's, on occasion. That's that never has happened before, is it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so we've stood at the airport and then had to pay a lot of money for a bag um, because they changed the rules in the, in the space in the course of the the journey um i also make sure i get there in plenty of time that the the what the luggage requirements are and what the allowances are and i make sure i meet them exactly mm. and the other thing you know you hear about these nine euro 99 flights uh, and, and this kind of thing do these flights actually exist can you really get a flight for that kind of money from where you are to you know somewhere in Spain or Italy or something yeah you used to be able to when they first were on the when they were first on the market you used to be able to get like I think I flew to the UK for five quid one occasion but not really now no but it's still a reasonable you still you're not paying over the like way too much yeah and it's uh, sometimes, I mean, when you factor out all the, the different elements in, like the travel time up to the airport, the parking, uh, the travelling on time once you arrive at your destination, then maybe, maybe you, you're better off flying KLM from the local airport. Mm. But that, that means getting a, a reasonably priced flight with KLM in that case. Yeah, of course. But occasionally, it has happened. Harp jets are, are <laughs> well known for being a little bit deceptive with their geography and uh, you see flights yeah. to oh Stockholm North Stockholm South and actually you look at it on the map and it's bloody miles away yeah ha has that got any better over the years would you say yeah I think it probably has improved yeah they still I think they still call Skarvstad which is in Nishopin which is like quite far south of Stockholm Stockholm I think my worst experience was when we um, were going to fly to France and the flights suddenly weren't running to the airport. So they offered us a redirect to Belgium because it was basically the same difference in yeah. the job state where we're actually going. But I think otherwise, I mean, some of the airports they actually fly to are pretty central, like the one in Malta. Mm. There's only, as far as I know, there's only one airport in Malta. There is. Isn't there? Yeah, just, yeah. just that's where they fly. Fl flies into Luca. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, in terms of when you get to these destinations, what about transfers? So let's say that they're, they're flying into Nishirping or whatever. Is, is there a bus transfer into Stockholm city centre, for example? Yeah, there's usually a bus waiting for people um, as you as you come out of the airport. I've never used it myself, so I don't know. We usually have the car park there. But um, I know people have used the, the airport transfer down to Linköping, Norrköping, south of, south of the airport. Yeah. Uh, and arriving at the other end, I've done it a couple of times where you've got on the airport bus. Uh, usually, if I'm flying to the UK, I get on the train instead. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Rather than sitting with my knees on my, on my chin, you know. Yeah. <laughs> now, can you buy those tickets on the plane? So you, can you have a sort of a seamless connection? So you buy the, the, the bus tickets on the plane or are they included in your ticket when you buy it online? Uh, I think you can. the option is there for both of those, but I'm not sure. Um, the, they used to always come around at the end of the flight and ask if anybody wanted to buy tickets for the onward journey on the bus. I'm not sure whether they do that now because I usually just sleep. Um, but um, otherwise, you know, it's, it's, everything's online now anyway, so it's easy to do. Yeah. yeah. Now, that was the next question I was going to ask you. Have you ever turned up at the airport uh, without your boarding pass? And have you ever had a situation where you've had to get it printed out uh, locally and they've charged you a fortune for it? There's some horror stories about that. No, because I play by the rules, Neville. <laughs> I make sure I read the rules and, I, and I, I'm prepared. I mean, you only get what you're paying for. I'm not paying loads of money for them. And then I, it pays me to just have an extra check, you know, through what's what I've got to do, make sure I'm a bit prepared. And usually when I've been traveling with the kids, you, you need to be a bit prepared anyway. 
Mm. So no, that's not actually happened to me. Yeah. Do you think that a lot of people that, that do take these flights, do you think they just turn up and they really haven't read the, the, the terms of engagement and, and the rule yeah. book and, and yeah, you know, so. they, they rock up with loads of luggage or, or they end yeah. up paying access? I've stood behind some people when they, they're standing there arguing about why they can't take like six bags onto the plane. I mean, it tells you everywhere. You can't have that many bags on the plane. You yeah. can't have your shopping and your other bag and your handbag and your other bag, you know. Being silly. It's a bit like standing behind people going through security where they suddenly realise as they're going through security that, oh, aren't you allowed to have fluids, you know, over 100 mil? It's like, oh, I've got all my hairdressing products. <laughs> yeah, it, it's... Um... It's a constant challenge, isn't it? But actually, you know, joking apart, this airline has, and EasyJet and one or two others as well, have really made European travel very, uh, relatively straightforward, um, but very affordable for those people, yeah. either with small or, or large families. And actually, it's enabled people to have uh, relationships, as it were, because people can go backwards and forwards. And you really couldn't do that on SAS, BA, KLM uh, and the regular mainline stuff, could you? I've got a sister who's got a cottage in Sweden. She'd never be able to go back and forth between Britain and Sweden as regular as she does. That would that made a, her lifestyle. Yeah, and I would imagine that she is a, a harp jet power user as well, isn't she? Because she knows all the uh, the rules of yes. the game because she's spoken yeah. to her sister about it. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say are the, are the disadvantages? What what are the things that you don't like? It used to be uh, the staff the staff were quite rude, especially at some of the UK airports. But obviously they've been given some uh, instructions to be a bit brusque and to make sure people conformed. And it's not nice to see somebody being sort of not very pleasant to customers because they're customers. They're still customers. They're not Maybe not paying much, but they're still a customer. But like I said, recently, the last few years, there's been a definite improvement in the way they treat the passengers. And they've cut out all this sort of measuring your bag, weighing your bag and giving you bad looks, that sort of thing. And are generally much nicer on board and at the uh, airports, I think. Yeah, you're right. Well, having lived lived in Sweden myself for a little while, uh, when we were working together, I remember there was very limited connectivity in terms of getting from the UK to Sweden and Denmark and, and Finland mm -hmm. as well. It was, really was SAS and BA and maybe a bit of... Yeah, they had the monopoly uh, and, and they could they could set the prices accordingly. Yeah, they could charge what they wanted to, really, can't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. And do you think there's a lot of pressure on Scandinavian businesses to use Harpjet as the most cost-effective form of travel? Do you, do you, do you find that? I well? don't think so, because uh, seeing as, as the other airlines' prices have come down so much, the place where I work isn't really a thing that you have to fly as cheaply as possible. You fly for... Yeah. So you get to the place you need to be when you need to be there safely. Now, obviously, all the stuff we're talking about is generally speaking within the European region. But there's been a lot of talk in the press uh, over the last few weeks about um, flights to the US from Europe uh, along the same line. So you've got, you know, people like Norwegian Air now mm. doing very good flights. Do you think that there's going to be we'll, we'll come to a stage where people like Harpjet or, or other people will be offering more and more uh, US based flights as well so that they can offer yeah, I can't you know, any reason why they uh, 50 euro flights to New York from uh, Stockholm or Copenhagen or something like that? Yeah, I mean, it's got, must be going to happen. Um, I mean, Norwegian started out as a a European airline, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can see it happening. I don't know how they'll be able to compete, really, though, because there are a lot of people carrying people across the Atlantic, aren't there? So do you think that the full-service airlines could ever compete with Harpjet and EasyJet and, and those sort of people? But I think it's actually the differences are smoothing out between them. Uh, I flew Virgin Atlantic a couple of weeks ago, and that was, you know, not that different from flying KLM. But I think the difference is definitely just evening out between them. I mean, even if you look at the websites and the way that people that you book your tickets online, they're all pretty much the same now nowadays. Before it used to be, you could very you could really see when you're on the Harpjet website because of the glaring colours and the nasty t uh, fonts, obviously. Uh, yes. But now, <laughs> but now I think they've pioneered the way a bit uh, when it comes to um, the online booking experience. I but I do the, think the other airlines have had to follow on with uh, follow on and and learn from the the different mistakes that Top Jet's done with the online booking systems and the ad, ad additional, you know, services here, there, and everywhere. Mm. I think that's uh, probably been uh, something that the other airlines have looked at. Yeah. Done it. And what, what's all this 
uh, lottery and scratch card selling that, that, I never that goes on. That. I never understood that. <laughs> do, do, I mean, do, really, do people... who wants a calendar? <laughs> you know, yeah, I used to quite feel sorry for this stuff, but I've not noticed that I'm doing it quite as much now. But um, yeah, it was a real pain for a while. Yeah. You know, every five minutes, you're sort of being shouted awake because they're trying to sell you a scratch card. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I think it's very interesting, though, that Michael O'Leary has decided that actually they don't want to be the nasty airline anymore, and that they yeah, that I think they, that's that, definitely uh, policy change. Uh, there, would I you say that that is? You, you've noticed that, or, or on yeah, the more recent yeah. flights that you've taken? Yeah, the last last couple of years, definite improvement in the way they look after the the passengers, and the staff seems happier as well less stressed um so what about the lounge situation now clearly harpjet don't really have lounges but uh, i know from where you fly from in, in lynn Sherping, where there's a connecting flight to amsterdam there, there's some lounge access there but what about that how, how does that work it makes a lot of difference doesn't it when you can actually sneak into a lounge and sit there and have a drink and have something to eat and just relax and then when you come down onto the down to the rest of the people who were flying you think oh god i want to get back to the lounge yes <laughs> when you mix it with the great unwashed <laughs> yeah you're thinking oh no is this where i belong no i should be back in the lounge <laughs> well that's right and you know we all like the lounge thing of course but, yeah we do uh, like the lounge uh, but yeah. it, it, you either need to get signed in by somebody else or yeah. spend an awful lot of money as we all tend to do or on expensive flights to get the status but it does yeah. make a difference doesn't it but if you've got a colleague that can get you in that's that's you know worth spending time with the colleague just for that thank you for your time and your positive comments thank you find this and other great shows at the aviation media network the voices in your head dot com the plane talking uk podcast is a voluntary project that aims to keep you informed with the latest aviation related stories from news buyers across the globe producing our content does cost money though if you enjoy our show why not help us keep on the air by making a donation towards the server and website hosting fees through paypal any contributions would be greatly appreciated are you an amazon user if so why not do your shopping through the link on our website there's no cost to yourself and amazon pay us a small referral fee on qualifying purchases to find out more about the show and to meet the team take yourself to our website www.plaintalkinguk.com or find us on facebook at facebook.com forward slash plain talking uk on twitter via at plain talking uk or get in touch via email on podcast at plain talking thanks, thanks for, for listening, listening. Fly B5823, Trent Dane for 23 hour Manchester, Wizz Air 6X, Client Flight Level 210, direct to Bretman's Park. United 123, maintain 280 knots. enough air traffic control for today, Nat. Bedtime. Aviation media has long been the domain of the newspapers and magazines. Well, not anymore. I'm Steve Vischer. And I'm Grant McCarran, and we're bringing aviation right into your radio. Yes, we're making aviation cool and interesting for everyone. Hang on. Aviation's always been cool. Check this out. How cool is this? Crash, crash, turn that down. Here at Plane Crazy Down Under, we've got pilots, engineers, air traffic controllers, industry leaders, even politicians dropping by to talk to us about the amazing world of aviation right here in Australia and occasionally in New Zealand as well. Wow, that's cooler than I thought, mate. Find us at planecrazydownunder.com, on iTunes, or lurking about on other people's podcasts just like this one. We've got crazy accents and lots of great aviation content. And we promise not to talk about the cricket. No, never. Not the cricket. Quack, 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 quack. <laughs> <laughs> what is cricket anyhow? Something we win a lot. Oh, there oh. we go. <laughs> Steady on up a bit. <laughs> a massive thank you, Nev. As always, sterling work. Or That's right. Being attacked by a wasp. Got a wasp, but I think he's yes. after my, uh, my food here. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. No, very well done. Yeah, it was a very interesting interview. Yeah. As always, lots of love in the chat room for it as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. great. Good, good. Any, uh, any sort of uh, inklings into what we've got coming up next week? 
Uh, yes, yep. I have, and uh, I'm glad you gave me lots of notes about that, so I can uh, <laughs> immediately. If anything, bring it. you should be used to it by now. He did it to you last week. Yeah, well. I know. And I, 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 had to, uh, I had to busk it a bit uh, r- rather quickly last week, but uh, yeah, I've got um, some more coming up, uh, mainly from my uh, industry chums, and um, uh, I will just have a quick look and see what um, Brave. what what's there. While you're finding though that they've they've you, they've, you we uh, we heard from you. We had a little chat last night and uh, that there are some pretty uh, hefty um, irons in the fire isn't there oh yes Coming up we, we, we are doing a, a, a lot of irons in the fire a lot of work behind the scenes um, to get some really interesting interviews and I've uh, just heard back from a couple of people uh, over the last week or so so uh, stay tuned because I think we're going to be doing some stuff uh, during uh, the back end of September or October I would say so um, people that you may have heard of as well so that would be interesting uh, so next week Week's Nev's passenger experience is Jim and Louise Harwood, Ooh. and uh, they both do a lot of travelling for business and for pleasure as well. And um, they've got a lot to say on the subject, as you can well, imagine. We're news. looking forward to that, we are, aren't absolutely. we? Yes. We, we've been joined by one of our local uh, local yeah. listeners, long-suffering so listeners. Introduce yourself Hello, to the it's world. Uh, Paul Trigger here. I'm um, yeah, <laughs> regular li- listeners of the show. Uh, Good to see you all again. Yeah, yeah. How, going, yeah. how are things then, Paul? Sorry? How are things? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, brought me uh, son Jacob along yeah. uh, as usual. Yeah, so, uh, oh, good, good, good. Yeah, it was nice to come down to the local show, so it's only a few miles away, so yeah. Uh, yeah, good to see you all. Excellent, excellent. So we do have a listener here, a local yeah, yeah. listener. We, we've met our one and only listener now. It's great news, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Introduce Say hello. Jacob as well. Come on, have you come? Say, oh, no, he says, no, no screaming. He doesn't, he doesn't okay, all right, yeah, abort. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Before it turns into cruelty, yeah. abort. He will not yeah. be bringing out his own podcast anytime, anytime soon. soon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good news for us for another couple of years. Then. I know. We're yeah, safe. Absolutely. We're safe. Indeed. Yeah. So we have got uh, another segment uh, which has been sent in to us by Captain Nick. So Captain Nick listened to uh, last week's show. Yeah, and we were talking about um, safety videos. Safety videos, weren't we? Yeah. yeah. So we've uh, got a segment from Nick which he sent in, and we're going to listen to that right now. So listen up, folks. This is your safety briefing. I'm going to tell you how to breathe when there's no air, how to get out of the airplane when it's burning and everyone behind you is dying. I'm going to show you how to open the doors, how to follow the lights to get out and find those exits. Just listen to me, because if you don't, you could die. I mean, that's the problem with passenger safety videos nowadays, and I'm not the only one to have noticed. They're very jazzy. They're very iconic. They're certainly full of sexy ladies or perhaps celebrities. They're sometimes with naked cabin crew just wearing body paint. Uh, They might feature fantastic views outside of perhaps your destinations or the origin of the airline. But do they actually include any aircraft? Not often. Do they actually show you the door and the emergency handle you might have to pull that's going to save your life? How it opens, whether it falls in your lap, whether you have to take it out and throw it out of the hole, what to do with that big hatch once you've got it loose? No, they don't do any of that stuff. They don't usually show you what the lighting is going to look like down at ground level. And believe me, if you're trying to crawl your way out of a smoke-filled cabin to go find that elusive exit, that's where your head's going to be if you're going to survive. Now, don't get me wrong. I I understand the need to make uh, a video worth watching to grab your attention. But it's well known that a video with lots of humor... the The passengers will remember the jokes. They won't remember the information you're trying to impart. They'll remember they saw such and such a sports celebrity, but they won't remember how to put on an oxygen mask or where to find their life jackets. And therein lies the problem. You want to get a video that attracts attention, yes, but you want to impart the information and not just turn it into an advertisement for the airline. So I agree with Scott McCartney of the Wall Street Journal who 
reminded us that on the miracle of the Hudson aircraft, the A320 that ditched, only four out of 150 passengers actually properly got into their life vest. The New Zealand Civil Aviation Authority also seemed to agree with us when they wrote a letter to Air New Zealand which said, as we have commented previously, the video diverges materially from the safety message at times and whilst I appreciate the need to engage the viewers, the extraneous material detracts from the scope and the direction of the safety message. So without being a spoil sport, I love the idea of having an entertaining safety video, but I want to see where exactly my life jacket is stowed and how to get it out. I want to see exactly how to open those emergency exits just in case I'm beside one that requires me to open it, or the cabin crew manning the main exits aren't available to do it on the day. So let's just remember what those videos are there for. They're not an advertisement for where to go on holiday. They're there to help us survive in an extreme circumstance. It might be rare, but geez, I still want to know how to do it when the time comes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Captain Nick. Yeah. I must say there's, what a uh, segment. there's always yeah. been a lot of love for, uh, for Captain Nick, I will say. Although, Indeed. although he, he has got rid of a certain item of, I, th uh, well, I, of I think the, the covering, the, the outcry I think means it will only be temporary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. If anyone who's uh, anyone who's seen Captain Nick lately, his uh, his minus uh, uh, a, a kind of beard item, yeah, <laughs> which uh, which is frankly frightening. Frightening. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah. but anyway, I no. asked uh, Mrs. Nev <clears throat> if she recognised. Um, uh, said person and she didn't at all and no, I, 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 I gave I her sort of five minutes to look at the picture yeah. and she goes no and she's actually quite scared uh, by how he now looks so very uh, right oh dear oh, oh dear oh yeah. my so uh, i think we're going <laughs> to see that beard coming back yeah absolutely pretty but, quick but uh, yeah. all beards aside that was uh, a really good was uh, a segment thing, from you yeah. uh, nick we he really still do sounds appreciate it awesome he does sound awesome yes. uh, i love his little little musical intro oh, he puts oh, oh there's again. some proper yeah. production values going on oh, yeah. there you yeah. see indeed so we do have one last bit of feedback which has been sent in by another listener and this is from glenn Tyler, uh, so we're going to play that for you right now. Hi, Carlos and Matt, and my fellow Plain Talking UK listeners. It's Glenn Tyler here from New Zealand with some more feedback. Um, we were talking in a, uh, on a previous episode about long distance travel and how most of us wouldn't want to ever do 17 hours from London to Perth or Perth to London, which sure you want to look at it. Uh, on Qantas 787 I agree I, I wouldn't do it I mean I'm, I'm used to long distance travel I mean I do Oshkosh every year and uh, you know that's like 30 hours of traveling but at least it's broken up with stop at layovers stopovers but, I mean this year my flight was Wellington to Brisbane which I think was about three hours then a stop short stopover in Bris in Brisbane then a then a Boeing 777 from Brisbane to Los Angeles. I think that was about 13, 14 hours-ish. And then it was uh, Los Angeles to Atlanta with Delta on Matt's favorite aircraft, the Boeing 757-300, which is, yeah, it's not, it's not good. The seats are very narrow. It's, a, as I think, the, fling, the flying pencil. It's so very long, just so narrow. It's not good. not good, but it's saying flying with Delta was good. Not, I mean, it's pretty good service. Uh, so yeah, I just thought I'd throw that in. Virgin Australia, I flew with actually from from Wellington to Los Angeles, and they're they're very good. Only nine across, and they're triple seven, Boeing triple sevens, and great service, great food. So no complaints there. Coming back was um, interesting. Um, Due to delays and flight changes, and uh, and and he's in actually lost my bag on the way back because the flight was so delay was delayed coming out of Los Angeles, uh, and then they booked me on Air New Zealand flight, which was a triple seven, which wasn't very nice because it was ten across down the back in economy, 
but so the seats were very narrow again. But the, the leg room was good because it was a, what they call the preferred seat. So, yeah, long distance air travel is okay, you can get used to it, but 17 hours, no. Uh, the longest I think I've done is 16 hours ish on um, Sydney to Dallas Fort Worth with Qantas, and uh, I said never again. I just don't like um, a lot of people who know me, who know how much I hate Qantas for various reasons. They also lost my bags for like three days. So a bit like Steve Bishop and when the United lost his bags. Anyway, blue skies and tailwinds. Uh, Glib. Oh, thank you, Glenn, for that. Yeah. Very always good to hear about long flights because I love long flights. The longer the better, I yeah, say. Which flight? Was, which one is it? The seven five seven two hundred. I don't uh-huh. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, we we we, we have talked about long longish flights before, and I will say I, I'd love a long. I, the longer the better. I'd sit on a plane for twenty four hours. hours. Fourteen hours is probably the longest one that I've done. Yeah, mine's uh, mine longest was uh, thirteen and a half hours at Singapore. Back to London, um, in economy on Singapore, not a great experience. Okay. Oh, right. And Matt, yeah. Matt's longest flight ever was uh, was uh, with his with United to Pittsburgh, I think, and, <laughs> and he'll never forget that <laughs> his, um, for the rest of his life. Yeah. No, indeed. And yet, I can say I, I flew all the way to New Zealand, like before I got scared of planes. Uh, flew all the way to New Zealand on. Don't ask me what aircraft because I have no idea. Um, before he knew stuff. Yeah, before I knew that planes were interesting to people. Uh, yeah. And uh, and that didn't feel anywhere near as long as my flight to Pittsburgh. So. <laughs> but uh, anyway. Yes. So we've got one last interview to play for you from uh, the Royal International Air Tattoo that I took uh, while I was there this year with my father. This one uh, is uh, with the, the Royal Australian Air Force and... Uh, and there were there with the wedge tail, and this was uh, with uh, uh, Tiny. His uh, name was. He's one of the pilots of the aircraft. So we're going to play that for you right now. So you join me again at a windy uh, react now. We're uh, standing uh, next to a Royal Australian Air Force uh, E7A, and uh, I'm here with uh, with Tiny Ben Timon. So Ben, tell us a bit about the aircraft we're standing next to now. Sure. Uh, the wedge tail, as it's called, is a, a 737 uh, 700 series uh, aircraft uh, with a big uh, radar stack on top. Uh, so it's an AWAC, an airborne early warning and control aircraft. Uh, we use it uh, mainly for fighter control. Uh, so we'll we'll fly into the battle space and uh, and control our fighters as they uh, as they go against uh, the enemy. So a bit about the aircraft, obviously this is based on, we said, like you said, the 737-700. What are the major differences, apart from obviously the, uh, the huge radar uh, wedge tail on top, what are the other differences the aircraft basically? Yeah, sure. So it is a 700 series. It has 800 series wings on it, uh, minus the winglets because we, uh, we have sensors on, on those uh, on the ends of the wings instead. Uh, it's a BBJ, so it has the auxiliary fuel tanks uh, in the belly of the aircraft as well to give us more time uh, on station. We also have an air-to-air refuelling uh, door, uh, so we can uh, fly behind our KC-30 or any uh, other tanker and take fuel uh, through a probe. So a bit about the obviously the, in, the interior of the aircraft is slightly different to the, the passenger side. Obviously, the, the uh, various bits and pieces inside are obviously a bit uh, hush-hush, so we can't talk about them. But um, so the, the aircraft itself, surveillance-wise, you, do you do sort of uh, just basic um, sort of maritime missions itself or yeah sure so inside we have 10 mission stations uh from there the boys get the uh, the information off the radar and they it's displayed in front of them on the screen we don't do maritime uh surveillance as such we uh more work with our fighter aircraft uh our p3 or p8 uh do the more the maritime type operation so a bit about yourself and tiny uh obviously what's your role on the aircraft Sure, I'm the uh, co-pilot on the aircraft, so I've been on this aircraft for about six months now. Um, I've been in the Air Force for five years now, uh, finished pilot's course in December, so this is my first uh, posting post-pilot's course. So your first time in the UK? For work, yes. Uh, I've been here a few other times for holidays and I love it. Uh, it's great. It's a great summer's day, if you could call it that. <laughs> I've got my jacket on. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's a bit cooler than Australia, but it's it's great. 
what we in, we had a few guests on our show a few weeks back actually from uh, Australia and it was minus temperatures where they were in Australia. Ah uh, yeah, so we're we're from Newcastle, just north of Sydney, uh, about two hours north of Sydney. It's about ten degrees there at the moment, so it is quite cold. Uh, back in Canberra, where the the capital is, uh, that's going to be about minus four, minus five this time of year, time of year. Uh, that's for sure. So a bit about your uh, background. Where did things start for you, Tiny? Where did the sort of the aviation bug uh, sort of kick off? Sure, I uh, grew up in uh, right near RAF Richmond, where our, our Hercules aircraft are based and uh, seeing them flying all the time just gave me this love for aviation. Uh, hearing them nice and low over the house, it, it just excited me. Uh, so I applied to join. I was selected in, uh, to join the Air Force and I went to the Australian Defence Force Academy, uh, which is in Canberra, where I studied uh, university there for three years before going on to pilot's course. And uh, with the licence-wise, obviously you fly this aircraft. Uh, have you, are you type-rated in any other aircraft at all? Yes, yeah, so going through pilot's course, we flew the PC-9, and uh, we were given a DCAT captain rating on the PC-9. Uh, so that was an amazing aircraft to fly. I, I truly miss it. Uh, so it's this Wedgetail and uh, the PC-9 I have a, a rating on. So look, with the com- sort of commercial time kind of flying, um, with the RAAF, uh, do you kind of progress from where you are now to the left seat after so many hours? Yeah, definitely. So I'm a bit of a special special uh, sort in the squadron. I've been trained co-pilot left and right seat. Uh, so I'm the first one to go through that training. Uh, but yes, we move from uh, traditionally right-hand seat co-pilot to left-hand seat captain. It takes about 18 months uh, to do that. So it's a lot quicker than the commercial world. And so we do have to learn very quickly and there's a lot of trust uh, placed on us and we have to perform. So moving on, sort of looking forward to the future and stuff, have you got any big plans uh, in place as to where you want to go? Any other aircraft you want to possibly move on to? I love the wedge tail, that's for sure. Uh, coming off course, I wasn't sure if I, I, I like it as much as I do, and I do, I love it. Uh, my plan at the moment is to fly it. I've got another four years on it, and I, I, I plan to try and stay on it as long as I can. It's definitely a, a unique aircraft, and it's uh, very capable. Excellent. So, Tiny, one last question before we wrap up then. Uh, it's a question we ask all the pilots we interview on the show. It's a kind of drop you in it kind of question, if you're ready for this. Uh, nothing too Nothing too bad. Uh, given the chance, uh, Tiny, to fly any aircraft in the world, either retired or still in flying service now, commercial, GA, mi- military, what would it be? Probably a Spitfire, especially <laughs> seeing them fly today. It's They're, they're brilliant. Uh, the sound they make, uh, h- how they fly through the air, I would love that. It'll, it'll make my day. It would be truly, truly something great to fly. And you've got some of those in Australia, I think, haven't you? Uh, yeah, there's a few flying around. Uh, I think down in Tamora, uh, where there is an air show uh, every year, I think they do fly down there. Um, I have seen them before, and they're, they're just great aircraft. Great. Well, Tiny, thanks ever so much for your time on the show today on behalf of the Plane Talking UK podcast. Uh, all the best for the future, and good luck. Thank you very much. Take care. It was awesome chat to Tiny, I will say. He was he was. A- Great chap. Those and, uh, uh, Riyadh interviews that you've done, Carlos, have been exceptionally good, I think. Oh, thank yeah, you. And, uh, that, that, I, no, I appreciate that coming from no, you. No, 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 very nice job and some very interesting oh, cool. people. Don't, don't, and don't be nice <laughs> to him. I'd like to see the ego. Oh. Yeah. No, 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 it was, it was good. Yeah, it was good fun. R- great job. Yeah, it, it was a great show. And, uh, you know, we, we were, uh, you know, we're lucky enough to be uh, yeah. to obviously have our passes to go there again this year. So massive yeah. thanks as well again to, uh, to all the guys at the Riyadh uh, Media Centre. Uh, across there, uh, thank you to all you for, uh, guys for uh, all the help and stuff we had again this year. So, well, that I suppose, guys and girls, is where we uh, want to start to bring the show uh, to a close. Uh, obviously, we are here at the Seeding Charity Air Day. We're here all day. The uh, air show has kind of just started uh, about a uh, quarter of an hour ago. And the first aircraft is doing a display right as we're talking. Uh, we are going to, uh, obviously, uh, after we've wrapped up this show, we are going to continue streaming uh, the uh, live coverage of the air show with our live cam, which is being uh, 
being very well, expertly, expertly operated, operated yes. by, by, Carl. Think, by Carl. I think if Carl has found his calling, I think, yeah. actually. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be using him again, I think, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, I think so, absolutely. Yeah, we might even pay him next time. <laughs> so, Matt, uh, Matt, where... Do you notice where it went deathly silent? Yeah. <laughs> so, Matt, uh, where can people find out I have absolutely us? no idea. Uh, right, uh, yeah, sorry, it's www.plaintalkinguk.com is the website. Our, our social media feeds, it's facebook.com forward slash plain talking uk and you will find us on twitter with our handle at plain talking uk uh, if you want to watch the show live if you've never watched the show live and you want the opportunity to do, to, do then so come to us and you don't or, or come to seating obviously you could <laughs> come and see us here uh, if you, uh, you uh, don't do social media but would like to watch the show we do stream live on youtube and it's mm. www.youtube.com forward slash c for charlie forward slash plain talking uk forward slash live so that's www.youtube.com forward slash c forward slash plain talking uk forward slash live and that's where you can watch our live stream that we usually do on a friday evening unless we've got a special occasion Not like today, today uh, where we um we, we, we do it live from the middle yeah, of an airfield I know. <laughs> so owen massive thanks for joining us uh, at the uh, seating air show today thank you very much for, for the having live me. show it's, um, it's so nice to be here it's, uh, and especially just uh, around the people that I like hanging out with. So, yay! Yeah, who, who are they then? Who else is there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, someone we don't know, obviously. Um, and uh, obviously, Nev, uh, thank you to you as well for for travelling all the way over to the other the, the other end yeah. of nowhere. Uh, it's hard to get a uh, special visa, us. actually, to, to come <laughs> yeah, this far. Yeah, yeah. You do need your passport to come into oh, Norfolk. Yeah. Uh, uh, just let you know, by the way, that uh, Carl and I have been doing some interviews today, which will play out as yes, later, later we have. Uh, yeah. time as well. Yeah, and I bet yeah. neither of you filmed it. No. 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 Oh, no, 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 no. I have video of one of them. So okay, well, okay. Owen has yeah, video yeah. of one of them. No, we Glad have. one of us remembered that it's a video show as well. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so thanks to you, Nev, for, uh, for coming and joining us. It's been a pleasure having you down here, as always. Uh, rather than through a Skype line. Yeah. Always nice to have you in person. That's okay. So that is That's where we are <laughs> going to bring episode number. <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm tired. I'm I don't so know how sorry. we're going to manage to edit that one out. <laughs> oh, dear. Who anyway, misses. <laughs> so that is where we are going to bring... Who would have thought it would be me that killed this, the, the child-friendly writing on this show? Yeah. Flipping Especially when we're, yeah. see, uh, when we're yeah. seated right opposite the bouncy castle. So that is where we go. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's where we're going to uh, put Matt down um, oh. for the rest of the day. Hello! Hello! <laughs> Hello! <laughs> we hope you've enjoyed our special show uh, here live at the Seething Charity Air Day. Uh, don't forget, we are going to be continuing to stream the live air show via the YouTube stream now. So don't disappear, don't go anywhere. Get your uh, Sunday roast ready, or your uh, or your dinner, or whatever you've got yeah. for dinner. Cup of tea, cup wherever of tea, it is you are and in the world, uh, sit yeah. back and enjoy the air show, and uh, enjoy Carl's amazing uh, video camera work up above above us at the moment. So that's it, guys, from all of us here in our outside portable studio. It is time to say goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.